Welcome back to another episode of the Huxley Morton podcast, where each week we speak to pharma company owners and industry leaders sharing their stories of personal and professional growth. This week, I am joined by Victor Dillard. Victor is the VP of Strategy and Operations at Resolution Therapeutics. Victor, doesn't feel like too long ago that I spoke to yourself, but um, good to see you again. Um, good to see you. In your own words, I guess, if you could perhaps just very quickly introduce yourself and, and Resolution Therapeutics to give us a, a, a setting and then we'll kind of rewind as we always do on, on the Huxley Morton podcast. Yeah, happy to, of course. So I'm I'm Victor, I'm VP for Strategy and Operations uh, here at Resolution Therapeutics. Uh, I've been here for about two years, I'm a French national from back, uh, by background, I've been in the UK for about 16 years and most of the time either studying life sciences or working in life sciences mm. and uh, resolution therapeutics is a very exciting cell therapy company working with macrophages which are a very unique and, and novel cell type to mm. treat uh, a very very high unmet uh, need that is liver cirrhosis so happy to tell you more about about both of those things macrophages liver cirrhosis and, and of course the broader the broader mission at resolution and, and my background awesome man of many talents then if you can cover all of that that'd be amazing well look sure. i guess on the show that we always like to, to rewind and find out how people first got into the industry now you mentioned there that originally a french national i would not have picked anything up but i guess accent wise after 16 years you've certainly shaken that off haven't you yeah. so look, uh, i guess if you were to yeah rewind and, and tell us how you first got into this space of studying life sciences etc a bit about your background that'd be useful yeah absolutely so i'm actually a, a chemical engineer by background so i'm a i'm a process guy or glorified plumber or you know there's many ways to cut it but sure. whilst while studying chemical engineering at imperial college i got fascinated with the idea that factories didn't have to be these giant refineries or breweries that we were visiting when, when in college, but actually could, could rather be invisible, highly complex cellular organisms circulating in our bodies. Right. So this took me into the world of biotech innovation, where I went to Cambridge to study a master's that was focused on that. And then, and then spent some time at flagship pioneering in Boston, mm. focused purely on creating new companies at the intersection of industry biotech, technology, innovation, you know, really harnessing kind of that incredible uh, mixture mm -hmm. of amazing talent and ideas that they have in the Cambridge, Boston area, and yeah. figuring out how do we create transformational companies. And that's what gave me the bug. And so with with some, some of my peers from, from Cambridge, we won a couple thousand pounds in a business plan competition, and we decided to set up our first company right there and then. So wow. in 2012, we set up uh, a company to try and bring tech into biotech. So at the time in 2012, we called it big data, and it of hmm. course involved into machine learning than AI. But the common thread was that we were just way ahead of the curve. You know, nowadays you say AI drug discovery and people bite your arm off to invest or maybe yeah. not today, today's market, but a couple of years ago. In 2012, 13, all the way through 16, 17, the, in the UK, this wasn't the case. And 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 people were sort of looking at us, do I really understand what is the role of technology and software in, in life sciences? Mm. But nevertheless, we built a really successful business navigating all the, all the challenges, of course, of being first time founders with a complex business model and a very, yeah. very complicated idea. But but I then sold the company in 2018 to a self therapy client of ours, and and actually at that time, self therapy was really our best product line at Desktop Genetics. That's the name of the the company I set up, mm. and that's what gave me the itch to get into that field. Wow. So I spent some time as a as an independent consultant working with innovative cell therapy companies, again, applying kind of all that software knowledge I had before spending two years at a pathology AI company called Alkin, structuring mm. their commercial operations. And then the role opened up a resolution. So I jumped on the opportunity and, you know, haven't looked back since. Wow. Okay. So it's, it's, it's I guess, unlike many of my guests, this is something that you set your sights on fairly early on by the sounds of things in terms of particular studies for this wanting to go into it, setting up as a, as a founder yourself and having some success there with as a sale. How, 
I guess, how did that all, all feel? Was that like straight out of university that you set up this company? Because that must have been quite a, a roller coaster to come yeah, straight out, straight into the business world of entrepreneurship and everything else. Yeah. I mean, how did you how did you find that? Because a lot of people talk about it and, you know, you see films like the social network with Zuckerberg and things like this of you know students coming out and doing big things how was that how was life for you at that point yeah it's a, it's a good question we we I don't know that we thought about it much at the time you come mm. out of university and you're you're you know you're young you've got a ton of energy and you're very robust I think in terms of of sort of what you can what you can tolerate in terms of of your personal life and your choices that that means basically that you you know we were prepared to come out of university make big sacrifices on 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 what jobs to take in the pursuit of building something and we we got hooked on it because we were learning so much you know there was a very strange dichotomy at the time where all of my peers and friends you know many of them were already a couple of years into a job for example maybe buying a house uh, getting promotions getting big salaries and i was sort of sleeping on a on a on a sofa bed in a mate's house for a couple of weeks and switching around and so so you're sort of wondering what, what am i doing but then then you spend your day at work and you're learning just an incredible amount of of things just by doing them so i think we were kind of hooked on that and and we, you know, we made a lot of mistakes, but we could see the needle moving. We could see we were making progress, and so that really gave us sort of the the the, the courage to keep going. Mm-hmm. And we surrounded ourselves at the time with with people who supported us, who believed in us. We we surrounded ourselves with people who who gave us good advice, and so there was a real kind of momentum mm-hmm. that carried us carried us through. I think you know the, those days at university when we were ideating and sort of thinking about crazy plans are really safe in a really safe environment mm. that that sort of gave us that initial energy to say let's give it a shot and so you you you're in this position where you give it a shot suddenly the opportunity presents itself i'm not going to lie I, I at that time i had other job opportunities which i turned down to go down that route wow because it just sort of it was there and i thought listen if it if it doesn't materialize I'll be able to go back and, and get new job opportunities, you know, but this this kind of thing doesn't necessarily just happen every single day. Where did you, where do you think you managed to get that mindset? Because, you know, if it's going, like, I guess you never know what's going to happen, do you? And it's kind of like people always talk about that fear of failure prevents so many innovations at times. Clearly, you probably did have that. I guess we all have that yeah. fear of failure. But <laughs> how did you overcome that? Or where do you think that that kind of, whatever it is inside you came from is it anything to do with parents or you know or was it or how important were those people that you surrounded yourself with that you just mentioned I guess yeah I, I I'm not sure that I've got it I can point my finger to a single source where that came from I think it's a combination of as you mentioned the people you surround yourself with and and the positive energy that you get from them in terms of guidance encouragement mm-hmm. challenges I think I was also in a very sort of good situation from a sort of personal perspective, having kind of left university with, you know, m- people that I met that were like-minded who also wanted, so I wasn't alone. And that's really important. And yeah. I think in starting a new idea, I I also thought if, if it's, if it's worth doing, it's got a high risk of failure, but that, but if the problem is kind of big enough, or if, if what we're doing can have a big enough potential, it, it's worth a shot. And and, you know, at, at university, we were told always about sort of the difference in the sort of mentality between the US and Europe in terms of failure and the value of failure. And I and I thought I, I identify more with the American mindset that it's better to have tried and failed than not to have tried at all. And mm-hmm. actually, people value failure more than 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 necessarily just first time success. Now, of course, you know, we're not on the cover of Forbes magazine. You know, we're not sort of Larry Page. We didn't sort of create the, the next tech trillion company in life mm-hmm. sciences that being said i think the the value of the experience we got personally for me is is what enables me in my role today it's it's carried me ever since and mm-hmm. and uh, you know, i don't regret a single minute of it awesome so talk to me about that that transition then. so the, the company had success sounds like you sold it what yep. was the how was that transition period because often i know when you sell businesses you're tied in sometimes to for a certain amount of time because the investors Partly, yeah. they're not just investing in the product, the service, it's in the individuals. So how did that go? How did you end up kind of migrating away from that? What was that period of your life like? How long did it take? There's 
sorry, there's about a million and one questions yeah. thrown at you all at once there. But if you could try and explain that for us, be helpful. Incredibly challenging period of my life. The my, my first uh, ever M and A. It's incredibly tough. It's getting a transaction over the line. We had a competitive bidding process. You know, we we were in a position I think where we had both strengths and weaknesses so it was a very tough very very tough period mm. and once once we were acquired i naively went into it thinking great you know we're going to have new wind in our sails new opportunities none of that materialized absolutely oh. none of it and i think that's not necessarily the the sort of uh, an isolated case i hear this from a lot of founders who who sell and then find themselves sort of itching to, to, to move on. When I sold the company, it was on the basis of a promise made to a lot of our customers that we would carry through all the work that we had sold to them and we would yeah. ensure the contracts were delivered. I ensured that that was the case. And once, once I was happy and satisfied with the work that we had delivered to all the customers that I had brought into this, this m and I handed in my notice. It just wasn't the environment for me. We, we weren't looking at any kind of growth opportunities or anything, anything particularly exciting. Yeah. So it just, I think I had, it had run its course. Um, again. How did that it, feel? Cause yeah. it, is it a little bit like kind of handing over your baby to an extent? It's like you've, you've built <laughs> this, uh, you've put a lot of time and effort into it. And then it's kind of like, yeah, I've done my bit and now I'm going to, yeah, let go. I mean, I mean you, you, you hand over sure? the baby. <laughs> yeah, though you hand over the baby the moment you sign. It's no longer your baby at that moment. The moment you sign and the deal is closed, it's no longer yours. And now, wow. part of making sure that the baby's well cared for is is the tie in. And in not only did we deliver the all the contracts, we also turned around a profitable PNL. And so we left, in my view, the company in a very good state, mm. having handed it over to 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 the acquirers. Now, what yeah. they do after that with it, that's that's entirely on them. And you can't take any personal responsibility for that because you you've taken the company all the way through. To to the sale mm. and then even after that you went above and beyond and you delivered internally on all of the lock-in promises on all of the all of the now promises and you've delivered a positive pnl now i think i'm very proud of the work we did was it difficult emotionally yeah of course but was i frustrated by the, the strategic decisions they were making every single day and i <laughs> always thought i would do things so differently but it wasn't up to me anymore and that you know we that that was it was coming to terms with that yeah. That I thought, actually, this is kind of fantastic to sit back and see where they're taking this because I disagree with this, 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 and this. So great. Now I have an idea of how I want to do things. And, and it sort of gave me a bit of, of peace and, and respite. I also think, I also think it was, it, it was important for me to sort of see that and, and at some point be able to, to go through that myself. Cause one of the really challenging things when you're founding a company or joining a very early stage venture is to is to avoid this sort of like intricate association of your personal self with with your business self and with the company. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's super important to be resilient. It's super important to be motivated and, and to never give up. But you also have to take care of yourself as an individual. And to do that, you need to be able to detach yourself. And, and yeah. the process of selling the company and then the tie-in after that, I think, was a big learning curve for me in terms of learning how to detach myself from the business. Wow. Well, look, this is all a, a complete <laughs> eye-opener. I, I had no idea about this part of your backstory, Victor. So I'm, I'm liking this so far. And so you've gone through all of that. Clearly, it must have been, you know, your head's all over the place with these decisions that you're not necessarily a, a agreeing with. But you you move on, as you say, you hand over the baby. That's no longer your responsibility. You detach yourself to an extent. How how long after then did you end up with resolution? Was there any interim positions? What what was that transition period like to to where you are now? Yeah. So the, the the moment I left, I took about six months to enjoy some time to myself. I was doing some independent consulting on the side and just sort of trying to take back control of my own destiny, I think, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> of course, one of the things I did is I called all of our shareholders and I said, listen, you, you've seen the great work that we did. You saw our sort of work ethic. You saw our, our integrity. You saw the qualities that, that that we had as a founding team that I had as a founder. Um, I'm looking for my next opportunity. Do you have anything available in mind? Anybody you could introduce me to? And so a couple mm -hmm. of them put me in contact with various funds across London and in the US. And I had meetings with 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 these funds that that very similar to flagship you know create their own companies 
Mm. So that's actually where the first time I came across resolution, that was back in 20, like late 2019, I met right. uh, Ed, who introduced me to resolution at the time, they were setting up the company in Edinburgh. And the, just the timing wasn't quite right for me. I was in, in London moving house and just wasn't quite the, the right timing. So I took mm -hmm. up an opportunity with with a Paris based company called Oakin, which, which focuses on applying AI in digital pathology. So I came in with a, a whole bunch of, of software and AI sales experience in life sciences and so i help them structure their commercial operations help them raise their 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 next financing round help them close some big deals with with pharma and then really learned a ton about actually what a culture in a company can look like i think for me that sort of interim period at okin was hugely instrumental i worked with some terrific people but more importantly, I learned what a very positive culture can do. At mm -hmm. Desktop Genetics, we were so young and such sort of first time founders that personally, I think whenever people told us about culture, I thought, yeah, yeah, that's some MBA uh, nonsense that people say <laughs> to make themselves feel good. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, people have got to deliver, you know. And so I don't think we invested very much in culture. And then the, the company that acquired us even less so. The, 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 then the, the move I made after that to Oaken, I thought was a complete opposite. And I just saw, okay, wow, this is what happens when you can get people to like each other, to enjoy working with each other, to spend time really investing in your people. Mm -hmm. And so that, I, you know, I spent two fantastic years there. It was hard to leave when, when, when Ed called me in 2021 and said, hey, we have this opening now at Resolution, do you, are, are you in? It was very hard to leave Oaken because I had, a, had such a great time, but I just, I wanted to be in the cell therapy space. I wanted to be working directly with a, a therapeutic product that was that was cell based and and so i made the jump fair enough okay so the, I, I, I again you're not the founder of uh resolution but do you know it's clear that you know that cell therapy side of things is important to yourself it's where the interest is i mean could you either elaborate on kind of why you joined and, and share a bit about kind of where the the idea for, for the business came from yeah um, of course so yeah just so that we've got a bit of a, an overview of, of resolution absolutely so the, the company let me take you back to the the company's founding so the company was founded in 2019 and and what happened at 29 in 2019 is a couple of things kind of converged one there was this, this collaboration between Syncona, which is a london-based cell therapy expert fund cell and gene therapy the University of Edinburgh and the Scottish National Blood and Transfusion Service, so SNBTS. So they, all three of those entities collaborated on process and cell engineering work around making macrophages. And at the same time, the results of a, of a phase one safety study run by the University of Edinburgh were being published. So those two things came together in 2019, showing that one, macrophages were well tolerated in a study run in nine patients. And two, we could engineer macrophages, we could freeze them, we could manufacture them more effectively. That's the research collaboration. Mm. So when those two things came together, Syncona founded Resolution Therapeutics and invested about $50 million a Series A wow. at that moment. Mm. So the company then took off from there. What, what, when, when I first heard about the company, it just, just at that initial founding, and what really interested me was in a world, you know, I was I was very keen to get into cell therapy and I, and I looked at the cell therapy space and I said, okay, how I'm going to go and talk to these companies, T cell and K cell, they're, they're working in oncology. How do I differentiate mm. them? I don't understand what's different between one T and another T cell company, one in oncology, the other one. in oncology. So there is a very crowded space in my view in T cells and NK cells. And so here came along a cell therapy company working in a completely orthogonal indication, so liver cirrhosis, inflammatory mm -hmm. liver damage, with an, a cell type that, again, in my time at Desktop Genetics, at least, were, were considered to be impossible to work with. Right. And actually, now a very novel and potentially transformative cell type that people are excited about using also in oncology, but certainly have a huge application in inflammatory diseases. Mm. So this, this kind of unique combination for me made resolution stand out from the crowd in not just one, but two dimensions. And I thought, okay, here's a really unique opportunity to get into something that's completely new. Mm. We're going to be breaking new ground, not just with the cell types that we're working with, but also with the indication. So that means that 
the, the, the clinicians, the patients, the hospitals, everybody's going to have to now get on board with cell therapy if it works, of course, cell therapy in this in this world. And mm -hmm. so that was hugely exciting for me. And that, that's why then I I was interested in joining. And of course, you know, as I said, the timing and, and two years later, I came on board. But but that's sort of the inception of resolution and, and, and what attracted me to it. Wow. So what did what did life look like for yourself at the beginning? So you'd been kind of, um, you know, one of the founders where it sounds like it was very much that startup culture, sleeping on friends, sofas, etc. To then go into the company in France where culture was a, was a big thing. And yeah. you said, sounds almost like it was chalk and cheese between those two. What did things look like when you first joined Resolution? Because you mentioned there kind of the three companies coming together. Where were you based? Was it London? Was it uh, yeah. Scotland? You said was you know how how did it look in terms of headcount, staff numbers, offices, etc. Yeah, it's a it's a good question because Resolution started during COVID and 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 it was a company that was effectively remote mm. where the founding leadership team and the investors were based in London and we're zooming with the founding scientists, you know, Lara and Phil, who are still with the company today and who are postdocs in, in mm. Professor Forbes's lab, who's, whose technology is, is really at the inception of the company. Mm. And they were clearing boxes out of labs in, in Edinburgh. And so it was incredibly remote. And they, they hired in about 25, 24, 25 people at that time. Mm. And when I joined, I was effectively employee number 25 or 26. Yeah. So, so the what things looked like when I joined was a team of incredibly passionate scientists who had gone through setting up and building a company in COVID. So they'd gone through something very unusual and came out the other end having produced an incredible amount of very high quality science. And I was look when I when I joined, I was looking for three things in a job. I was looking for fantastic people to work with. So honest. In uh, people with integrity and people at the top of their game. You know, that was for me the number one criteria. Mm. Working on very innovative and solid science. And that was the macrophage cell therapy. And the third one was in a position where I'll be learning. And that, of course, if you're if you if the first two are met, the third one is pretty much guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So I came into a company where it was it was a very young, motivated, hugely energized team of people who are who are very collaborative. And so I joined and, and learned a ton from everybody and was able to also contribute huge at the beginning, huge amounts, and, and hopefully still do, but huge amounts at the beginning because what they needed and also what they didn't have at the time was somebody who was on the operations and business side. So yeah. working on the contracting side, uh, applying a kind of strategic mindset to the decisions that we're making. Mm -hmm. And so there was a real sort of synergy and, and it was a very, very exciting time. I was based in London, but luckily by the time I joined, I was able to go up to Edinburgh and I went up probably every two weeks at the, at the beginning to yeah. just spend face time with the team. Because for me, it was so important to really embed myself, not as a sort of remote new guy in business development who's based in London, but actually a, a fundamental member of the team. Mm. So you mentioned also there that you you kind of learned, you know, you wanted to, to, to go somewhere where something was going to be new, you're going to be pushed, you're going to be stretched, learn new things. Was it like drinking from the fire hose, so to speak? You know, how much were you having to take it, take in? How, because I guess to an extent, I almost feel like you had, you've been there and done it of learning all this new information when, as being a founder yourself. Yeah. How was it doing it under the banner of somebody else's organization? How, how was that? Because again, having been yeah. the founder, the leader, I, I love the question. The difference? Yeah, I love it because the difference is efficiency. So doing it as a founder is drinking from the from the fire hose, but you, it's incredibly inefficient because you're you're having to sort of learn everything almost from scratch. So you're almost trying to reinvent the wheel every time from scratch to figure out how a wheel works. Mm. A resolution it was drinking from a fire hose, but from people who know their science, know their technology, know their bit, like people at the top of their game. I'll give you an example. Mm. I my first day on the job, I took the train from London to Edinburgh. Big mistake, as everybody who takes a train from London to Edinburgh knows. I was thinking that. And there's also you said that. in November. <laughs> so clearly I wasn't on time, right? I arrived I arrived with about nine hours delay. I was supposed to arrive at noon, meet the team, go out for dinner. I arrived at the office at 6 p.m. And I, there I met the scientific team. And we sat down and we had a three-hour conversation about macrophages, like straight in on day one. They just kind of went straight into it. 
And I loved it because I'm just hearing straight from the people who know their stuff and who know it so well and so in, in, like inside out that mm. I, it was an incredibly rapid but efficient, I think, learning curve for me. And then the next day was big scientific deep dive with all the teams and then board meeting. And so same thing, you're learning from people who, who have this deep expertise. And that's really the difference. And when, when, when we were founders, when I was a founder, we, we, I learned in almost in isolation, having to sort of figure out from scratch a lot of these things. I was also, at the time, working in the CRISPR space. And sort of that was a very new thing at the mm -hmm. time. So I was learning, I guess, with everybody, but from scratch about these things. Yeah. Here, I'm able to draw an experience from, from, from incredible people around me. And having the backing of Syncona means we also have access to a ton of really experienced people in our, our parent company who have experience across regulatory, clinical, who've seen dozens of cell therapy companies and gene therapy companies come and go, who've seen hundreds and thousands of pitches. Yeah. So there's a, an immense amount of wealth of experience uh, to, to draw on. And I think that's really the key difference for me. Gotcha. No, I was, I was interested about that. I just, yeah, hearing you say that, I was thinking, well, how would I deal with that myself in a, a kind of similar situation? So look, coming on to, I, I guess, resolution and the cell therapy, you know, I hear about cell therapy a lot, but as a, as a recruit, I'm kind of removed from it. I'm, I place people into companies and that's kind of my bit. I'm trying to match the culture with the people, et cetera. But in terms of how it works, it may or may not be your area that the science side of things, but if, you know, you could give us a, a layman's term as maybe overview as to yeah, of course. what resolution is doing, if possible, that'd be amazing. Yeah. So with patients at the forefront of everything resolution does mm. the company is pioneering macrophage cell therapies for end stage liver disease so what does that mean so our first product called rtx001 is what we call an autologous cell therapy so the patient cells are actually taken from their blood in a in a what we call a leukapheresis mm. and then they're they're improved so they're manufactured they're taken to a lab they're manufactured then in in a lab with with a, a cocktail of different kind of of chemicals that help them grow in a particular way and then we engineer them to give them some specific properties and then we we freeze them down and then have multiple doses that we can ship back to the hospital and reinfuse into the same patient whose cells were collected. So it's a right. that's what autologous means is that it's sort of an N of one. Cells come out, they go to the lab, they come back out and they're administered to that patient. Mm -hmm. So this this product that we're working on is engineered specifically to enhance specific properties of the cells that that maximize a sort of anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrotic properties of the macrophages so that when they are when, when they're administered into the patient and they find their way to the liver, the cirrhotic liver, which is highly inflamed with a lot of fibrosis, so a lot of scar tissue mm -hmm. crisscrossing the, the, the liver, they're then able to actually perform their, their work and their job at the, at the best they can, reduce the inflammation, chew up the, the necrotic tissue and break down the fibrotic scar, giving the liver the ability to basically kickstart itself its regenerative cycle again mm. and that's really sort of what we're working on at resolution and, and why liver cirrhosis well liver cirrhosis is actually a disease that affects millions of people just in the us and, and europe M millions of people it and it stems from um chronic injury to the liver whether that's chronic alcohol injury so so you know alcoholism is a big driver mm. but poor diet is also a, a huge driver hepatitis b and c viral infections which are which are still rampant in many countries actually even even in the west mm. is a big driver basically anything that chronically injures the liver will ultimately give rise to one fibrosis and then you keep injuring it then you give rise to cirrhosis wow. patients with cirrhosis at that point have about a when they when they sort of get diagnosed with cirrhosis they have sort of a they're in a state called compensated which means that their liver can still perform the function that it that it has which is to, to filter the blood up until a point where they have one of these sort of events called a decompensation events and and that it can take many many forms but essentially means that the liver sort of the, or the patient and the disease have kind of fallen off a cliff where suddenly their mortality drops from about two years no, from about sorry for when you're compensated about 10 years down to two years so you've, you've had right. this sort of event that now your mortality your sort of 
mean mortality is about two years. And if you have a second one, it's down to nine months. So you're sort of in this downward spiral where your liver is failing more and more often. Mm. And so 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 it's a very kind of scary part of the disease. It's a it's a very difficult time for patients, for for families. It's expensive to to the healthcare system because mm. What is the alternative? You know, patients have these events. They typically find out they have cirrhosis for the first time when they have these events. And, and they find out by, by coming into the hospital through A&E, often maybe even admitted into ICU, they get treated for the symptoms of the event, but not the underlying cause. Right. So the cirrhosis doesn't get any treatment because there are no treatments out there today. The only treatment really is a liver transplant. Which, uh, which, which, as you know, is probably something that many people think about as having a really long waiting time. And it's also quite an invasive surgery. You know, mm-hmm. you, you might have seen pictures of some people with, with huge scars and comes with a, a lifelong aftercare that can be very complex. So, so when, you're in a, when you're faced with cirrhosis and your only option is a liver transplant, you know, what, what do you do? And so the role here at Resolution is to say, actually, we believe that the macrophage cell therapy platform we're working with can provide patients with a completely new and radical alternative to liver transplant and not need even liver transplant, hopefully in the future and actually help help the liver kickstart this regenerative cycle because it has this innate, wonderful property that it, it self-regenerates. Mm. So that's really what we're working on. And our mission is to, is to bring this to patients and to commercialize a, a technology that's based uh, on these macrophages, and that's that's going to help people with liver cirrhosis. Wow! And look, if, I guess how does the 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 financial side of this look? Because I think that was one of my first thoughts when I heard about it. Is like, okay, liver transplants, etc. They're quite invasive, expensive. Um, how you know how affordable by comparison will this be? You know, what's the if you can give us a bit of a, a background yeah. overview on, on that side of things, okay, it may or may not be your area directly, but if you yeah, can... no, of course. So let me let me take the U.S. market as an example, as, as yeah. really sort of the, the the primary healthcare market in 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 the world. So <laughs> in the U.S., a liver transplant costs the range depending on where you live, but perhaps on average, it's around three quarters of a million dollars mm. for a single liver transplant. That's a huge amount of, of, of money for, yeah. for, for a procedure that's not a cure and actually is not really scalable either, right? There's a, there's a big shortage of donors. It takes up a whole operating room. It takes up, you know, surgeon time. I mean, it's, it's really just not a sort of scalable solution. Mm. On, top of, on top of the cost of a liver transplant, the cost of a cirrhotic patient is these emergency care costs. So you've got, hosp- you got your ambulance transfer, you've got your hospital admission, you've got five to 10 to sometimes 15 days in inpatient treatment, treatment of the actual underlying cirrhosis, which isn't possible, but treatment of the, of the symptoms. Mm-hmm. So, so these kind of events that I mentioned earlier can cost anywhere between uh, thirty five to $65,000 a pop. And so when you add up the cost, economic burden of liver cirrhosis in the US, you're talking about a multi-billion, multi-billion dollar problem. That's four mm. and a half, five billion dollars annually, the cost of these of these events and caring for, for cirrhotic patients. Yeah. It's a very high economic burden on the healthcare system. Now, of course, it's a great question because self-therapy isn't cheap. Mm. Right. I, I kind of explained the complex manufacturing process that we go through. Yeah. Uh, that's that's clearly not. That's clearly not free, and it's clearly a lot more expensive than stamping out pills uh, that you know you might be familiar with in traditional pharma. Mm. But that being said, I think autologous cell therapy is very well suited as a modality for a disease like cirrhosis, when actually the the, the economic burden of a single patient is, is well, 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 well higher than the cost of manufacturing of that cell therapy. So the economic equation does balance, and it's something you know that that we've had to look at very early on because mm. why embark on a journey? where we're going to develop an expensive product to make if it's just, you know, if, if the if the kind of financial equation doesn't stack up on the other side. Mm. We believe it does. And and we believe that it, it's going to bring it's going to bring really a, a transformational sort of a treatment to patients who who without it have absolutely nothing other than a liver transplant. Mm. So how I mean, so how's it going? I, I I don't know if you're able to disclose kind of specific data or things like that. <laughs> but you know, in terms of the the, the tests that you are running, the the initial work that has gone into this, how are things 
looking how you know are, are you on target in terms of kind of growth data etc yeah so uh, you know like like every other biotech today i think we're it's going as well as it can be in the kind of env market environment that we're in we're, we're we're also fundraising and so it's it's challenging in the financial sort of setting that we're in that being said i think we have as i mentioned a very unique and differentiated value proposition and we're very fortunate to have some clinical proof of concept. So actually, nice. just last week we presented at the at the at the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease in Boston data from this second clinical trial run by Professor Forbes at the University of Edinburgh. So, so his clinical research fellow presented in in you know in front of an audience of of peers and and key opinion lead, leaders in the liver disease space mm. data from from their phase two study and that phase two study was quite striking. It looked at 50 patients. So it's a randomized, controlled, it's open label, so parallel groups, but it's, there's a control group in there. So the patients were randomized in both. Yeah. And in the treatment group, 26 patients received treatment with a macrophages. And in the control group, 24 patients were followed with just standard of care. Mm. The results were one on the safety side, a very, a very positive and compelling safety profile that that you know effectively confirmed the results of the phase one study that the the the, the therapy is very well tolerated by patients. Mm. On the efficacy side, what was very striking is that in the one year results in the treatment group there were zero major adverse liver related events, wow. so no deaths, no hospitalization due to to the events, no mm -hmm. transplants. In the control group, there were four of these events, three of which ended up in a death. Wow. And so there was a real kind of striking contrast in terms of clinical events, which is, which I mean, and, and in terms of kind of seeing data like this in cirrhosis, you know, when, when this was presented, a lot of KOLs were just sort of, yeah, we, we haven't really ever seen anything like this in cirrhosis. So there's a real exciting clinical proof of concept here that macrophages, macrophages work in, in resolving in fibrosis and in, and in helping patients with cirrhosis. Mm. There is a, a longer term follow up that's ongoing. We, you know, we're mining through more of the data, but I think it sets us up in a really exciting position as part of our fundraise with a unique and compelling value proposition. So I'd say things are going are going very well from that perspective. And, you know, I'm, I'm very hopeful for what next year and, and the years after that are going to bring. Mm, no, it sounds like things are going well. And I, I guess, you know, with things going well, and I guess with presentations like this going on overseas, et cetera, I mean, how how has the company changed? And, and, and what role, I guess, have you played as the, the VP of strategy and operations? What does your day-to-day -day look like now compared to, you know, that day one where, you know, or certainly those early days traveling yeah. to Scotland on a, you know, very very long train ride sit yeah. you know, late night meetings and then straight yeah. to that meetings the next day how how has your role changed over the years so today the company's in the in a really interesting transition phase from being a preclinical and research focused company to being a clinical company so we've we've just initiated and, and recruited our first patients into our first study it's called opal it's a study that that looks at the natural history of patients so it's not an interventional study we're collecting data from patients who are participating who have cirrhosis and who are willing to contribute samples to help you know us understand the evolution of the disease and yeah. we're about a year away from starting our first interventional study for for rtx1 called emerald and so <clears throat> So that's a big shift as a company. You know, we're going from when I joined, it was research, research, research. Let's let's answer these key research questions. Let's innovate. We're still very much on the innovative innovation bandwagon, but now it's also about quality, making sure that we're delivering a really robust manufacturing process so that we're we're very confident that the products that go out the door will go back out to patients are of the highest quality and that that quality is properly monitored and properly captured and that we're making kind of really important but good and well-grounded decisions for patients so it's a very it's a very different mindset because it's whilst patients were first in our mind even when i joined now they're very much front and center of everything we do and it's a very real relationship because you know because patient samples are arriving in labs to to be to be analyzed so yeah. i think part of my role as part of that as well has been to help introduce 
in across our, our operations and, and strategy teams, a lot more structure in terms of the way that we report on the progress of key activities, and the way we disseminate information. But it's also, we've grown, right? As a team, when I joined, we were 25. So getting people to talk to each other was very easy. Today, we're about uh, 68 people. We're split across London and Edinburgh, probably 60% of the people up in Edinburgh, 40% in London. Mm -hmm. We've got lots of different teams, you know, clinical operations, regulatory, you know, research process development. So part of my job and my team's job is to connect the dots across all the different teams to make sure that all the stakeholders are participating in the key strategic decisions, but also are informed Mm. about what they need to know to make those decisions. So it's not just about structuring how we how we report, but it's also about how we disseminate that information internally and how people act on that information and capturing those decisions and just helping really build that solid foundation for us to build the next stage of the company. Mm. It's, it's really, you know, you asked me kind of, you know, describe the role. I'd say it's very, it's very cross-functional. I work with almost every function across the company on a daily mm. basis. And you need to be, you need to sort of be, obviously, you're not going to be an expert in every single aspect, but you need to be sort of well-versed enough in across all of the aspects of the company so you can have meaningful conversations with everybody, but you're not, you're not there to do their job, right? There is a head of research who's going to be doing the research or head of finance, but you need to be there to be able to have the, question, the, the conversation and ask the key questions to get the information that you need so that the, the finance and the clinical people can also sort of make the, the decisions based on what the research, see what I mean? So you're sort of, and, I, rem and, uh, I remember and, you know, now, what I love about back it. to our first conversation and I labeled you as the cross-functional glue, I think it yeah. was. Uh, well, so, and so, you know, <laughs> I, I mentioned sort of glorified plumber at the beginning, chemical engineering. That's at the end yeah. of the day, I'm, I'm sort of in charge of the plumbing <laughs> internally, right? I'm connecting <laughs> all the pipes to make sure that, that the information mm. flows properly. And, and that's, you know, the... <laughs> I spent four years at Imperial drawing boxes and arrows between A to B and, you know, chemical yeah. A comes in and gets converted. <laughs> but that's a lot of what we do is really understanding how kind of decisions are made, taking the assumptions, make, you know, uh, make, make decisions on the back of that. So cross-functional glue, glorified plumber, you know, whichever you want to call it, it's, it's really exhilarating. It's no, no two days are the same. No, no, no. I guess whatever we, we call it. I mean, what I love about kind of just hearing you talk about all of these things is, it sounds like you've still got that founder's passion, right? You can't, you can't hide that. You're still very, very much like, no, this is how it's, you know, we're getting things done. You still seem to have that, yeah, get stuff done attitude. So yeah, absolutely loving that. If you were to try and pinpoint, I, I guess, any areas that, that you've maybe changed, however, is there, yeah, w would you say there must be something, I guess, because do it yourself to, you know, being that cross-functional person, now with a, a larger organization. Yeah, how have you how have you changed? How have you had to adapt? Is there different skill sets that you now rely on more than what you did previously? What areas have, have developed? I think for me, the areas that have developed are the areas that are linked to people and culture and leading teams and making teams work effectively. Mm. In my first company when I was a founder, <clears throat> I think I took that for granted and I didn't invest nearly enough time and energy into that and I expected people to just sort of band together and gel together. I expected people to just want to deliver at the top of their game. Mm. Today, I actually think that investing my energy and my time into my team, supporting their growth, supporting their uh, success internally is the key to not just my personal success, but the key to the company's success. And so it's, it starts with how I act personally towards my, my direct reports and my team, how yeah. I act with my, with my kind of peers at the senior management level, but also how I interact with, with anybody else in the company. And so if I believe in the fundamentals of having a, a successful company being built on a team that is is honest, has integrity, collaborates, and is ethical, then if I if I can really a demonstrate those four behaviors myself, but invest in that across the, the 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 board in the company. So if I believe in collaboration and I don't collaborate with somebody in another department because they're in another department, mm. that's just not going to work. So that for me, that's been the massive change is actually realizing that if I if I go out and 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 speak honestly with people from other departments and collaborate with them, that's going to just help and grow the company and it's going to make us all successful. Success mm -hmm. is not built by one single individual. And that's 
thinking back to that early journey of of desktop you know you're a founder it's very solitary so of course success is very much felt personally because you've sort of spearheaded the company and it's you and i can't i i can't see it as i mean for me that's so far from the truth today that that you know of course your contribution to 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 the edifice is is critical but mm. you know with, with it, without everybody else, we'd be nowhere. So that's very much a mind shift from sort of the solitary route of of success as a founder, as a sole mm-hmm. founder, to to actually being way more sort of successful personally and 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 professionally by being part of the the right team. Mm. Well, look, you're certainly preaching to the choir uh, on that one. <laughs> I'm, sure. I'm, I'm often saying exactly that to to my clients as a as a, a recruiter. So you know, the, the strength of any business, I believe, is built on the strength of its people, and it seems that. That is the way you're you're looking to go. So it brings us nicely on to, I guess, plans for the future and expansions, more innovations, et cetera. You know, it sounds like things are going well. There's good data coming in. But what, you know, if 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 you and I jump back on a podcast in a year or two years down the line, what would I guess success look like? What 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 plans have you got? Yeah. I, I mentioned the the opal study that we're running so if, if we if you and i touch base in a year we will have we'll have collected incredible data from opal with get, gaining a very new and and unique understanding of the evolution of the disease in 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 the industry mm-hmm. uh, and also we will have uh, we will have started and dosed our first patients in the emerald study mm-hmm. uh, so uh, our first product will be in the clinic it'll be tested in 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 in, in patients and so that journey means that you know, the success looks like a successful filing of a of a CTA, a clinical trial application here in the UK. Mm. It looks like a, a successful recruitment of patients across different sites in the UK. It looks like a successful technology transfer to our manufacturing partners, and it can and of course, more importantly, to make all of that happen, a very very successful fundraise. Mm. Indeed. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of work that has been done, just as much work to continue to be done. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. And I'll have to perhaps diarise another podcast appearance from yourself in a year to see how it's it's all gone. Yeah, happy Um, to. But look, for for now, we always wrap up the show, Victor, with a a quick fire questions round. So in true fashion, we'll do exactly the same with yourself. And I'll kick that off just by asking that. It seems like you've been very successful in kind of shortish life compared to some of the guests that I've had on. What would, what advice would you give to to your younger self? So someone who's you know perhaps going through university, thinking about founding a company, yeah. is there kind of one piece that maybe sticks out to yourself that you would advise? Yeah, I'd say back yourself when you're at university and and you know every day, but back yourself. And use that time at university to explore as much as you can. It is genuinely the safest place to try and fail. People are so much more generous with their time to students than with working professionals. So make the most of it. You know, you're you're a poor student. You're just there to learn. You reach out to somebody. Of course, they want to talk to you. You now work for a company and you want to reach out to somebody to learn. No, no, no. You know confidentiality agreements, you know, consulting fees, everything, you know, all the barriers come up. Whereas when you're a student, people are incredibly generous with their time. And I think it's an amazing place to just try and fail and try and fail and, and then learn from that. So make the most of your time, of course, connect and socialize and, and enjoy the safety that, that it brings as well from a sort of social perspective. But I think in terms of, of your entrepreneurial journey, it's where it starts. Very I really, that. I really, really believe that. And I, I still work with with student teams across Imperial, Cambridge, and help mentor these these teams and help mm-hmm. them spin out of the university. And you know, it doesn't always work out. So what? You know, that that's part of the journey, and it's and it's an incredible amounts of fun. Mm, you're you're spot on now. I, I was um, going back through some of our old episodes recently, and realised that that was one of the pieces of advice that Craig Lipsit gave when he was mm. on the show. He said, "Look, he, often people say, how do we? How on earth would we get hold of you? You must get hundreds and thousands of emails and things." He was like. Just drop me a DM on LinkedIn. You know, yeah. I, you know I'll, I'll get a DM from a student and I'll respond to them and I'll help them out. It's just no one ever actually does it. And he yeah. says, actually, when they do, he responds. Uh, and that's, you know, I, 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 I mean, true story. This happened to me maybe last month. You know, a student is working on, on, a, on a master's dissertation. They're looking to sort of get a primary data about self therapy companies or people working in the industry. 
very happily engage. Companies reach out to us for surveys. No, we don't. We don't respond in the same way. So I think you know, <laughs> make make the most of it. And it's you know, pe people are. I certainly am. So definitely don't hesitate to reach reach out to me on LinkedIn. Awesome. My next question is, uh, I guess, doesn't necessarily have to be work related, but number one book or resource that you would recommend for our audience. Yeah. So. Work related, it'll be. I I love the weekly biotech podcast by Stat News. I think it's a really fun way to get news every week. But if you are into podcasts, actually, I think and further afield than life sciences, I really enjoy how I built this by NPR. I think there's some incredible founder stories on there, from the founders of Five Guys to the founder of of Tinder who got booted out and founded Bumble. I mean, some incredible stories, genuinely, re and really well interviewed. So I highly recommend that. If you're more into the tech side, I think theory and practice is a really great podcast as well. It goes into the, the world of AI. So both of these really fun, not necessarily work related, but, mm. but kind of give you that motivational entrepreneurial spark. Awesome. I'll have to check that NPR one out myself. What, That's what amazing. How, how we built this. How I built this. How yeah. I built this. I'll have to yeah, check it's, it it's a, myself. So, yeah. Guy Ross does the interviews and, and it's it's really well done gets some gets some amazing you know the, the other day he interviewed as well the, the founder of suit supply fantastic story really mm -hmm. fascinating i mean there's just there's a lot to learn there from people's experiences and actually it's somewhat also therapeutic because you hear it and you go yeah okay i, I went through the same thing i'm not alone people also experience this challenge <laughs> so it's both instructional and therapeutic for me though i love it I like it yeah probably fit fit well for me I'm, I'll, I'll jump on that um, and look, speaking of things outside of work look we all probably do too much work at times but what do you do outside of work to relax enjoy yourself victor um so i uh i love to it's very cliche but i love to take uh, walks with my wife and dog we have a we have a lurcher called whiskey that's just really enjoyable i think it's uh it's very whimsical character so that's that's a very simple and wholesome thing to do and if i'm not doing that then then skiing would be really my my guilty pleasure and that's you know very much a, a time where i can disconnect mm. Awesome. And look, final question then to, to wrap up the show, a bit of a deeper one, but what is your number one golden rule for, for both life and, and business? I think it's it's linked to sort of qualities that I, I look for in the people I want to surround myself in. And so not to compromise on these and, and, and these are you know, diversity, integrity and honesty these are the three ingredients to me for, for for the people i want to surround myself with and and so the golden rule is is to is to not compromise on these three awesome stuff well look victor it's been an absolute pleasure uh having you on the show yeah there's so much there that kind of i had no idea about i appreciate <laughs> the, the broad knowledge uh from your end and then i guess look for anyone that wants to learn more either about resolution or about your your story what's the best way to to get hold of yourself and, and the business websites etc so linkedin probably for resolution the therapeutics you, you know linkedin search us on linkedin or go to resolution hyphen tx.com or on on twitter and then for me just dm me on linkedin as well very very happy to to share more awesome stuff well look, thanks again for joining me on the show thanks james great to speak to you today cheers